So I'm going to talk about some specific species, and, and there's lots of forage species that we can use, and, and I'm going to concentrate on some of the main ones. If you have questions about the other ones, we can talk about those. But, but by far, in, in states um, like Maryland, in Virginia, West Virginia, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, it is what we call the transition area of the United States. So what that means is that we're, we're not really in the south, and we're not really in the temperate north. We're kind of tucked in between those two. And, and, um, and, and that gives us a lot of forage options that we can use. And our best adapted cool season grass in this area by far is, is tall fescue. Um, we, we often view fescue as a curse and, uh, because it is infected with something called the endophyte. And that's a fungus that lives within that plant. And that endophyte, the, the natural endophyte or the toxic endophyte that infects tall fescue pastures, produces a toxin called ergovalein, and that causes vascular constriction in the animal and can lead to reproductive issues in, in, um, in cattle, in horses, in, in small ruminants. Um, and, and often, because of that, we view this as a, a blessing. But the, but the simple fact of the matter is, is that Tall fescue in this part of the country has weaned more calves than any other single grass. And we really need to think about how can we make this a blessing in our grazing systems and how can we utilize it to its maximum benefit. And, and that's going to come from focusing on management. We're going to look at things like optimizing soil fertility, managing for legumes in that stand. One of the strategies for reducing the toxicity of tall fescue is to, to keep a healthy stand of legumes mixed in with that pasture red clover, white clover, and maybe even alfalfa in some cases. Incorporating novel endophyte tall fescue, this is kind of the latest story, and we'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, the latest chapter in the tall fescue story is this novel endophyte. So it's an endophyte that gives the grass a, a, a tolerance to stresses, but does not produce the toxins associated with poor animal performance. So this is, this is really, really exciting. Now, having said that, this has to be managed in a grazing system. This will not do well in a continuous stocking system. It needs to be rotationally stocked. It is different than endophyte free. So while I'm here, we might as well just give you the whole tall fescue story. So tall fescue was discovered, and I'm going to go over on my time already, I can tell. Yeah, so so um, tall fescue was discovered. It was originally imported from Europe and hay. It was discovered, Kentucky 31 was discovered on Hillside, Menifee County, Kentucky, by a researcher from the University of Kentucky. And it was green and growing in the winter months when the other grasses were not. So he, he selected some of those plants, brought them back to the University of Kentucky, increased seed, tested them in, in plots, and it did great. He uh, further increased seed, and then they released Kentucky 31. Kentucky 31 was the fastest adopted grass ever because before Kentucky 31 there was not a really good fit for a cool season grass in transition zone states like Kentucky, Virginia, and so on. And um, so it was the fastest adopted grass ever and in the 1940s and 50s everybody was planting Kentucky 31. So they got it all planted and then they started to figure out that animal performance was lower than expected uh, based on forage quality. And, and nobody could figure out exactly why, but the animals would do poor on, on Kentucky 31. So it wasn't until the 1970s uh, that a researcher from Georgia figured out that it, there was an endophyte in this grass. It was associated with this grass. So, um, and, and that pastures that didn't have this endophyte in the grass, and there are some of those endophyte-free pastures, um, the animals would do much better in. So, so as researchers do, they took that back to the lab and they said, well, we'll just take the endophyte out of the grass. And they did that. And it was not, not too hard to do. You can just simply heat the seed up. And as you heat the seed up, that endophyte's a living fungus within that grass. It dies before the germination of the seed goes down. So, so they did that and they made endophyte-free seed. And um, they said, took it out, they put animals on it, tested it, and the animal performance was good. They said, problem solved. You know, everybody go back and plant endophyte free tall fescue. And a lot of people did. And animal performance was good. What they did not realize is that endophyte was there for a reason. That gave that plant increased tolerance to stresses. So it has a mutualistic relationship with that grass plant. 
It increases the tolerance to stresses, uh, both abiotic and biotic stresses, insect damage, grazing, um, drought stress, and so forth. Um, when they took that out, they made that grass plant weaker. And so people planted endophyte-free fall fescue, but it didn't persist. And that's kind of where we were at until we figured out that there were what we call novel or friendly endophytes. And, and those give that plant increased tolerance to stresses, but it doesn't produce that toxin that's associated with poor animal performance. So that's kind of where we're at now. And, and again, as I said earlier, when we use a novel endophyte tall fescue in a grazing system, we've got to manage it better. And the reason why is the animals don't get any negative feedback um, when they're grazing in the summer. So with a toxic endophyte tall fescue, animals would eat it, but, but they'd feel really bad. They'd feel sick. They were running a low-grade fever on it. And, um, and that caused them not to graze it as hard. That feedback is not present in novel endophyte tall fescue. Yeah, if I could, in your folder, All right, so where are we at here? Oh, we got a question here. I've got a real nice slide on that, but it's not in the, um, not in this presentation. And, and the answer is, is legumes help, for sure. But, so, so say this was um, this was the performance on a toxic endophyte pasture. Legumes would be here, and novel endophyte would be here. So so it does help increase increases forage quality and it dilutes the toxins. But but the toxins are so potent in tall fescue they're potent in parts per billion, not parts per million, but parts per billion. So so adding legumes helps, but it does not solve the problem. So, so you're better off with a novel endophyte rather than trying to incorporate legumes if that's an option for you. Dr. Escobar? So the question is, is whether that the uh, endophyte persists in the hay. And the, and the answer is, is that during the curing process, the toxins produced by the endophyte break down. So they're not completely stable. But they can still be present at lower levels within the hay. And we saw a real bad case in Virginia probably about 10 years ago, a lady had bought some um, tall fescue made in the fall, so uh, and she was feeding it to miniature horses. I don't know why she had miniature horses, but they were little tiny things. And she had like a dozen dozen of these brood mares, right? And, um, and, and she was having terrible problems with foaling. And uh, long story short, I ended up going up to look at, at the situation, and she said, I... I just purchased this uh, orchard grass hay, and, and I said, well, I got good news and bad news for you. I said, the, the good news is, is um, this is the most beautiful tall fescue hay I've ever seen in my life. It was green and, and dry and cured well. I said, the bad news is it's tall fescue hay, and, and we tested that hay, and it was very high in ergot alkaloids, and, and that was causing her, her foaling problems with horses. Horses are especially sensitive. Um, to ergot alkaloid. So the answer is, is it's decreased most of the time, but it still can be present in hay. Baleage does not decrease ergot alkaloids as much as curing for dry hay. So that's important to remember too if you're making baleage in your system. All right, one of the, one of the strongest and I, I feel most underutilized attributes to tall fescue is stockpiling for winter grazing. All stockpiling is is saving that, that, that fall growth for grazing during the winter months. And, and we're going to see that today uh, at the demonstration farm. That's a really important aspect. And this is one of the easiest ways to extend grazing in this part of the country um, with tall fescue. This is actually outside of Blackstone, Virginia. And this is um, almost in mid-February of 2010. Uh, I was out of the farm and it snowed and crusted. And, and the tall fescue, this sward was 16% crude protein and 60% TDN. Almost always stockpiled tall fescue is going to be higher in forage quality than most of the hay that we make. And that's, that's important 
to remember, and that's one of the advantages of stockpiled tall fescue. It costs less than hay, but it's also higher nutritional value than most of the hay that we're feeding beef cows in, in this part of the country. Right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So, so, um, <laughs> the, um, you know, depending on your farm size, owning, you know, in, in this is not really an economics lecture, but depending on the farm size, owning hay equipment can be a pretty expensive venture. And, and, uh, yeah, so, and you've got the fixed cost of that equipment. So, when, when you buy a piece of equipment, you've got to write that check for that equipment every month, you know, if you take a loan for it. Every month, whether you run it over one acre of pasture hay land or 500 acres of hay land. So that fixed cost can kill you on small acreages. And so in most cases, you know, if you've got 30 or 40 cows or 50 cows, you may be better off to buy hay than make your own. It's a pretty, pretty inexpensive to buy hay if you really add the costs up associated with producing that hay. Every ton of hay has got about $35 worth of nutrients in it. So nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, sulfur. And, and when you look at those, the value of those nutrients, so when you buy a, a ton of hay, you're getting the feeding value of that hay. But it's also like they're giving you a little coupon back that says here's, here's some free nutrients that are coming with that hay. You got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 